listening to the 10 Questions with the Musical Mind podcast with your host, Peter Harris. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of 10 Questions with the Musical Mind. This is Peter Harris here. This week we welcome Mike Keneally to the show. Mike is a musician I've long been an admirer of. Uh, he's got a vast discography, everything from uh, Boil That Dust Speck to Sluggo to Dog to Scambot 1 and 2. Um, he's also a, a huge part of uh, and contribution to the bands of people like Steve Vai, Joe Satriani. He's currently embarking on a European tour with the one and only Devin Townsend. So uh, we get together and discuss his career from his beginnings with Frank Zappa to the current day and just what drives his creativity and what makes Mike Keneally tick. Hello, Mike. How are you today? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm um, doing great. Doing great. Awesome. Thanks, thanks again for, uh, for joining us. appreciate you taking the time out. My um, pleasure. I've got, there's a million things I could ask you. You've got such a diverse catalog, but I'm going to kind of start off on more recent events. I wanted to touch on your, uh, your touring experience with the bizarre world of Frank Zappa. Um, okay. the, the hologram tour and I've actually interviewed a few people who are involved in that this type of thing um, I interviewed a member of the uh, the Dio hologram kind of thing and it, it, it all has that sort of saying like is this the best idea in the world or is this wh- what is this <laughs> it's, it's, it's like anything new but, but more specifically what I want to touch on is how is that for you um regardless of the format, because it's really kind of returning to your first professional gig. I mean, what was it like revisiting that music? Is that... Is um, it... Well, it was a, it was fantastic to be able to to revisit it with those players. Sure. And and that's that's really what, what it stemmed from. For me, where my interest primarily was was to be able to, you know, after 31 years, to, to go back to playing those tunes with those guys. Um, and also uh, Ray White, who I'd never had the opportunity to play with before. So it was, it felt, you know, I think this is probably the, uh, it's it's got to be a common theme with a lot of musicians who get to play with somebody that's really important to them in an early part of their career. Mm-hmm. Like I, when I was growing up very young, uh, I was just obsessed with Frank, you know, I loved his music so much. Uh, but he was my first professional gig, you know, I, right. I was playing top 40 in, in clubs and stuff, but I had no touring experience. I had no experience of any kind with, with, with a well-known artist. Um, and that's where my career started, which is yeah, pretty a, absurd, you know, <laughs> right. but, it also, but it also meant, you know, I was 25 years old and only just lightly qualified. I mean, I'm, I'm okay with, with, with the job that I did for him and I can, I can go back and listen to those records without it you know sticking in my throat too much but obviously three decades later i've you know i've developed further as a musician and so in in some ways it was to me an opportunity to like revisit that material uh and and feel like i was i was able to bring more to it you know uh yeah and also to to, to, and and you know I've, i've tried not to like go to the zappa well too much in my career, I, I, I like the idea of keeping it pretty special when I do it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but I've had some fantastic experiences playing Zappa music over the last 30 years. But to play it with those guys brings something else out. Oh, it man. feels different, you know. And also the fact that we were playing on, you know, for a large portion of the show, we were playing along with with Frank. Uh, Frank performances on vocal and guitar. That we that we're listening to as we perform for about three quarters of the show. Right. Uh, so obviously that has a psychological impact on me and an emotional impact on me. It really feels like it really felt like a, a, a Zappa gig, you know. But I felt like I was able to to like just just cut it a little better, you know. Like, and and so it it was it was very satisfying. And from our vantage point on stage, we, we're just like focused on on hitting our cues and making sure that we're playing everything good and that we we are uh, tight as a band and, and producing a good band sound overall. Uh, but I had a lot of friends come to the gig and they said that it was a tremendously powerful experience. Uh, 
people whose opinions I really trust, like uh, Dave Gregory from XTC came out mm-hmm. and Stephen Wilson came out and, and it just like people who I, I trust not to bullshit me. Sure. And, and, and Greg Mendian is, is another guy, who, incredibly talented drummer and composer who, who came to the, the New York show and, and he was just, he was overwhelmed, you know, he could, he could barely speak. Uh, it's Chris Opperman, another one, the guy who used to be in my band, who now teaches music, and and Frank is really important to him, you know. And obviously, I know it's a it's a it's a controversial thing, and some people are, you know, up in arms about it and stuff. But but I, I can say with with full honesty that I was sure that 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 Frank would have gotten a kick out of it. I think yeah. he would have been highly amused by the by the visuals, and and also for people who just wrote it off and didn't come out to see it because they're scared of the word hologram, the, the actual, you know, holographic depiction of Frank, where it looks like Frank's up there, you know, standing and singing and playing guitar is, is, is a relatively small part of the show. There's only four or five tunes where that's it. The rest of the time, it's a much more kind of surreal and, 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 uh, right. freewheeling and, and, and crazy visual, uh, uh, depiction of you know the, the the song's plot lines coming to life and stuff like that so it really is just like it's hard to even describe what it is i understand why they had to use the word hologram as just a, a means of of branding the tour and it's just right. like an easy thing for people to understand but the, in reality it's just like this crazy night long uh multimedia extravaganza that's a little bit hard to describe you just have to see it and feel it and right you know, and I, I think most of the people who saw it and felt it had to admit that it was a really powerful night. And that's neat that the hologram is not in place of good live music. It's an addition to good live music. It's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's like, is it a good idea? It's it's another idea. It's another, there you, go. Uh, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's another thing to do. It's another thing to experience. Right. I, I don't see any reason for people to limit themselves. Sure. And, it, it was and I don't probably... think there's anything sacrilegious about it or, or ghoulish or scary and, and you know, Frank wasn't a religious person anyway. You know, it, it, it's like I, I don't think he would have gotten up in arms up, about any of the aspects of oh, it's a ghost. You know, I, I don't think he was <laughs> too uh, timid about pushing buttons anyway. He was, <laughs> he was no exactly, <laughs> exactly yeah. yeah. Um, it was probably about as surreal for you as it was for the audience. Well, I mean, from where we were, it's, it's we couldn't experience the the, the whole the you know the, the entirety of, right. the, of the presentation. It's not like I could. Frank standing there it wasn't it wasn't that kind of thing just the nature of the machinery that's required to generate the image right uh, you know we, we, it's it's a it's you know it's a technological thing that we are cogs in um, right but but it's it the thing that's nice is that you know one objection that that a lot of people had and I understand this is how can it be spontaneous when you're playing along with recordings of Frank it's got to be you know exactly the same every night uh, for one thing, it's not exactly the same every night because we had four sections of the show dedicated to us uh, playing without a click, right. playing without the pre-recorded material, and and we were able to be much more freewheeling and improvisational during those sections. And and also we were playing with unreleased Frank stuff, uh, you know, sure. long improvised guitar solos, and it really does feel like you know it, it felt to me like the way it used to feel playing along with Frank when he was improvising on stage. And the, the fact that there's a, you know, a lot of, of Frank's guitar uh, improvisation that, that is a part of the show and that it's not stuff that people have heard before. And even you know, though we, we heard it over and over again during the tour, it still felt fresh. You know? Right. Uh, it, it, it felt like I was playing, it all felt to all of us like we were playing with Frank. You know, yeah, that's and even just the idea of of unreleased solo playing. I mean, would get, I would think would get a lot of hardcore fans like just to hear that. I mean, any of my favorite players who are gone, if you go like, here's a bunch of stuff you've never heard before, sign me up. I want to hear that. I mean, yeah, and also we, we played several unreleased compositions of Frank's. So but before the tour, uh, Scott Tunis and I went. Uh, trawling through the storage closet at the at the Zappa office where they have boxes of Frank's uh, manuscripts you know handwritten charts and we went looking for unreleased stuff that that we could you know play uh, on this tour and we found a couple of amazing compositions and and uh, and I, yeah if, if I was 
I mean, I am a Zappa fan, but if I was just a Zappa fan and not a guy in the band, I definitely would have bought a ticket, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's pretty <laughs> remarkable just even, you know, at that age when you joined them and you were doing top 40 covers. I mean, just the mindset and the <laughs> almost the audacity, like, well, I've really got Brown Eyed Girl down. What's next? I know, the black page. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea how, how accurate you are. That's <laughs> very funny. But I mean, obviously, I was just playing, uh, you know, top 40 tunes to make a living or something resembling one. Uh, but in the back of my head, that's that was my dream. I used to literally sure. dream playing with Frank. So, you know, I've said it often. To start my career there is was was an unbelievable thing, and and, and in some ways disorienting because after that was done, where do you go from there? And it sure. took a little while to to figure that out. Right. I'm I'm hopeful that we'll do more next year, and 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 also we've started doing shows just because the band loves playing together. Uh, we it's it's a very complicated, expensive uh, uh, operation to, to move around the, uh, the the hologram show the hologram tour, but it's not as complex or expensive for the band to just get together and, and gig. So uh, a, a few weeks ago, we did some shows in California just at clubs. We played at the Whiskey. We played at uh, at uh, the Big Potato for a mm-hmm. couple of nights. Uh, we played at uh, a, t- a club in San Diego called Dizzy's, which is near where I live, and and uh, and we had so much fun, and it was just it was easy, you know. It's, it's like uh, we can, we know how to do this, we know how to do a gig, right. and and it, it felt really cool to literally just be left to our own devices for the full night. So so now we have like two potential entities. We can we can tour as the the, the hologram tour, right. but we can also do gigs just as a band that goes and does gigs you know the collective amount of hours that 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 us in the band have have spent playing zappa music you know in our lives is 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 telling you know so sure. when, when when we play this stuff it does have an impact and my gosh when we played in in la we had uh we had ralph humphrey uh come out and play drums we and ian underwood came and played with us at the whiskey which was mind-blowing for me because he's of all zappa musicians he's like my hero and ruth underwood who i idolize I came out to see us play at the uh, at the baked potato, and she was just so sweet, and uh, and you know it meant so much to me that that she came out and said the things that she said, and 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 you know it's it's an, in, for me it's this incredible experience yeah. to be going through this this uh, this this phase of my career at this point, which yeah. I didn't necessarily see coming. You know, I, over the past decades, I've I've often wondered if there would be an opportunity to play with some of the guys from the band again and uh, and finally all these years later it's happening so I'm really Isn't that great delighted. yeah now yeah what a great second chance and you know I also was kind of curious about not long after that gig <clears throat> um, with Frank you worked on, on Dweezil's Confessions album um, that's a hell of an album that's well, really that was good actually album. the first album I had by him um, um, I didn't have the one he had before, the Had a Bad Day, or I did not have that one, but I, Confessions is the first one by, by him I bought. Um, were there any kind of differences, similarities? Like, what did you observe at the time as far as working with Dweezil? Like, ooh, I get I, I get where he's coming from because of this, or wow, he's vastly different because of this, or did anything well, I mean, strike it's, you? It's, well, I mean, I could definitely see the, the impact that growing up in that household and hearing Frank's music had on him because – one of the more intriguing things about about Dweezil musically is that he doesn't really think about music in, in terms of uh, like straight up and down time four four. Right. Uh, when when he just lets his brain go and his fingers go, the the, the way that the riffs and, and his ideas flow is are generally in very odd groupings, very strange time signatures. Yeah. But it always he would he had a way of like writing these riffs that that even though they were. If you analyze them musically, they were really peculiar. They they just they were propulsive and they rocked really hard and it was yeah. really powerful playing his stuff. Uh, and, and but then there was like this severe like hard rock grounding that came from his uh, this his you know idolization of of Eddie. You right. Know? I mean, so, he was very much a product of that generation of players, and he was very much coming from the yeah. Frank DNA worshiping Eddie Van Halen and and. You could definitely tell and, that, and also, and also the you know the Vi influence because right. Steve helped him out when he was very young and just sort of like showed him some stuff, and, I, and I, so I think there's sort of like an, an equal amount of, right. of those uh, ingredients, uh, and then when you add it on it to the mix as the lead singer, right, 
who and who is like to me, he's one of the most entertaining front men. Yeah, that, that ever taken to the stage. He's just fucking so funny and so entertaining, and, yeah. and 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 does not just doesn't care. You know, he'll say anything, he'll do anything, and I love that. You know, because I grew up loving subversive weird shit. You know, right. I, I grew up loving Frank for one thing, but I also always had a real a taste for like weird subversive humor you sure. know i loved i love andy kaufman i love national lampoon i love all this stuff right. that is not concerned with it's only concerned with convention <clears throat> to the extent that how can we twist it you know right or, you know how how can we get an audience to expect one thing and then completely turn it on its head so that that dweezil band you know which first was called dweezil zappa band and then it was called z right is it's still one of the most powerful live things i've ever been a part of it, it, because it had this huge, I mean, we're all, we were all a lot younger in those days, we're talking about the early nineties. Uh, so it, it, we had an you know, endless amount of energy. Uh, and, but it, it had incredible rock and roll, just power to it. And at the same time, musically, it was insane because all we did was rehearse. We would rehearse all day, all day, you know, all week. We were paid to rehearse. You know, we didn't play that live that that often, but right. but we but we were on retainer, so we would rehearse five days a week when we weren't gigging, and that's what allowed us to learn some of the insane instrumental stuff that we did, and also just the songs themselves, which were, you know, generally much more complex than 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 maybe they seemed at, at first listen. And then we had this insane uh, medley we used to do, which was. 200 songs from the 70s yeah it, that were strung together in like a, a half hour medley sometimes 45 minute medley if if, if on it yeah, couldn't be couldn't be curtailed you know he would just go <laughs> off uh but to to hear this medley is there's there's some versions of it on youtube but i don't think like the full uh extent of it has has, has gotten out there publicly uh we did 200 songs from the 70s and the, the way the songs would be glued together, you know, because the, it would segue, you know, s just from one hard cut to the next, to the next, to the next. And every segue would pivot on either a word or a note. So, and it didn't matter what that would do to the time signature or the key signature or the tempo or anything. So it, it to hear it, it just sounded like an endless, uh, you know, parade of tape edits, but right. we were doing it live. And, and, and and it just wouldn't stop, you know. And, and you, so you would see the audience go from, you know, first they'd be rocking, and then they'd be amused, and then they'd be aghast as it wouldn't stop, and then they would just like glaze over, <laughs> and then hey. eventually we all, you know, we would all together reach some kind of state of satori where we would just like had been through this crazy experience together, and we were all we were all better for it at the end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It was an intense experience. Yeah, that, that's that is pretty that's that's pretty cool. And yeah, I've uh, I've interviewed Dweezil, and and I don't remember specifically the example he was citing, but he was describing some idea he had for a song, and it, he was composing, and it was it was very mathematical. And he was like, "What if I do everything based on this number, and 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 um, and not just timing? It, it was something some odd idea that he had, but but it mm -hmm. it was good to get a, a glimpse into his his thinking, and it's definitely not, you know." verse chorus verse bridge out, you know it's that's which he'll no, do not, but it's not it's, the way he works it's right. not the way he's wired yeah yeah but it was it was interesting um now usually as far as you go i, I ask in 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 generalities like how does, like how do you tend to write a song which usually the genesis the seed of how you start writing a song but with you I, i'd like to kind of maybe go more specifically just to get ideas on specific songs like uh a song like popes um <laughs> what what was the genesis of that like was that a chord progression first or was it a lyrical was idea a tuning. first that, tuning that, okay that's, that's a strange tuning uh well I it is I yeah remember. i haven't played it in a while so i don't remember what it was right but it was just it was just a I'll, I'll frequently do that and unfortunately sometimes I'll do it and I'll record the song without writing down the tuning and I'll subsequently forget what it is yeah uh, uh, but that that was just uh, based on just the guitar part which originally was was uh, just something I wrote at home on an acoustic right. and it's just a vibe it's a it's a yeah. feel uh, so once I got that that riff it's that that's that's what that's what that song what? was. Yeah. You know? uh, and then it's like, okay, I've got this groove together. And then for me, 
songwriting is just about you've got a starting point and then you you let that starting point point you in some direction sure you know? so with, with that it's just uh, one riff always leads to another if I just uh, relax enough to let the, the riff suggest where it's supposed to go next you know uh, and then once I, I string together enough of these things and that's a fairly simple tune so there's there's only like maybe three or four kind of sections in it right uh, you know I'm like a lot of my songs where I just keep piling on the sections uh, so once I got the, the basic skeleton of it together and then went in the studio with the band and recorded it I, I had I think I had that 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 groove and that backing track together for a good several years before I, I, I finally said okay I gotta uh, this needs a something this needs a lyric and a melody what's it gonna be okay. you know and at that point it's just like experimenting with melodies I'll, I'll, I'll sing different melodies over it because more often than not, a, a song of mine, at least these days, I noticed when I was younger that I, I, I wrote lyrics first a lot of the time and then would, would write, write music to go with it. But nowadays, it's much more likely that I'll come out with the music first and then you know, find lyrics to decorate it. Uh, I think that's a function of the older you get, the more songs you've written, the, hard it is, the harder it is for me anyway to find interesting things to write songs about. I can see that, yeah. Uh, because I've never been a guy that just writes you know, songs about sex or you know uh, or even love in, in in a conventional sense which provides a lot of rock songwriters with apparently endless fonts of inspiration but but it, it's like for me that's covered and it, <laughs> yeah and it, and you know what it's not that i haven't written love songs but I, I it has to it has to like spring out of a real genuine impulse of the moment and and not just like okay i'm gonna write another love song because that's what people like to hear right and plus you know when i write something i have to feel like it's it feels authentic to me something that's genuine uh, uh and for whatever reason the way my brain works that tends to go into more you know sort of like surreal or or, or just you know strange avenues right no so I, I get I, that totally at this point i can't i i, I can't deny it uh so i'm i've got this this Groove for Popes, and then eventually I got this melody. Boom, down, boom. Oh, oh, I'll tell you what. I think I uh, the, the title came before any words or even a melody oh. came, because like I wrote this, I wrote this groove, and you know it's like, I think it was Edgar Varese that somebody asked him why, why, how did he come up with the strange titles for his pieces, and and, and he said it's a convenient means of cataloging the work. <laughs> it's like I like that. You have to call it something, you know. They are a convenient means of cataloging the work. And that is, so, yeah, that's true. It's yeah. a, I've <laughs> you, you know it. written some songs. I'll just throw down some title, and then yeah, a few yeah. months later, I'm like, oh, that's good enough. It's yeah. It so, I know which song so, it is now. It's <laughs> yeah. So I, I so the first word when I had to you know I, I came up with this groove. I recorded a demo of it at home. I needed to call it something, and. Who knows why brains work the way they work? But the first word that came to my mind was popes. So for several years, I had that word popes connected to that music before I had any idea that it was going to be about popes right. or what, what uh, you know, or what approach I was going to take. Was it going to be you know some bit of social commentary or was it going to be something completely absurd? And you know, eventually, I was like, what do I have to say about popes? Uh, when I finally decided, okay, I think I am going to call this thing popes. And then I came up with a melody that I liked, and then I just I just you know researched online the, the history of, of popes through the ages, and realized that a lot of them have really interesting names. Sure. Let's write a song that involves all of these different popes throughout history, as though they are all existing at the same time, and they're all just kind of hanging out partying. Right. So that that and then and then you just like try to find, for me, constructions of, of words, uh, syllables, vowel sounds scansion things that flow that aren't and i knew that that the, the song is going to have a lot of words in it so it becomes more uh, uh it, 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 it's more incumbent upon me to like work hard to make sure it doesn't come come off feeling awkward like i'm, I'm trying to cram a bunch of syllables into a, a compact space yeah that it should roll off the tongue even though it's even though there's a lot of words in there so then it's you know you just it's trial and error it's it's you try this line no we'll try this instead no and then you just you just keep at it and chisel away until you end up with a set of words that that both tell some kind of story no matter how weird and also 
sounds good, you know. Right. It, it, it does kind of trip off the tongue, and and for me, it's always does the vowel sound match with the note in that spot? You know, it's like it's like this, the way the line is rising and falling. Is it does it feel resonant with the song as a whole, or is it fighting the song? Yeah, and, and something like that where you're fitting a lot of, especially with a lot of words in there, I, I can see how it, it's hard for that to come across as whimsical yet catchy and not just pretentious for the sake of being pretentious. It's That's a fine line. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I do tend to go to the to the, the, the humor well uh, mm-hmm. fairly often. Uh, maybe, you know, some people say that, that comedy is harder than drama. But uh, for me, it's always just about how do we, how, do I feel comfortable singing this? Does it feel like me singing this? Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. And and I you know and you know there's some songs where I I, I, I get more serious and and it's, it, that'll happen when it it feels authentic. But then other songs and and, and again it's also like the the way the music sounded. It just had this sure. kind of loping groove and I just kind Absolutely, of wanted yeah. it to be a good time, you know. But a good time that that was just you know a, a little bit. Twist it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Now, do you set boundaries for yourself? Like, I mean, obviously, you can change the parameters whenever you want as the songwriter. But, um, like a song like "Splain," um, right? When once you got that going a little bit, did you say to yourself consciously, or like, okay, I like where this is going, and I'm going to keep it all acoustics and like clean tone electric, or and you should try to limit it to that because that's where you're going, or was that just what it ended up being, just because that's what sounded right? Well, that that was written on acoustic, and and it, just because a song was written on acoustic, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to stay there. But it it definitely felt to me, again, this that's another song that has a whole bunch of words in it. Yeah. Uh, and and I and I I knew it was that it was going to be a fairly, you know, for me, kind of an accessible thing. Yeah. You know, that, that that and because the the chord structure itself wasn't too uh, too weird. Right. Uh, so. I, I I knew again that I and and I would imagine that in my recollection because I I know when I that that in that era that like early two thousands era mm-hmm. I was I was like I was consciously trying to write more accessible stuff at times mm-hmm. uh, lyrically but uh, but I, I I was like coming out with like really I was making up words that uh, both wooden smoke and and dog which both came out of that that same general era. There's like a lot of invented words uh, on on those albums. Uh, and I was and I, I was like going after vowel sounds and, and I, again and like being really like I I can't find a real word that that <laughs> makes that makes the sound and, and gets the feeling that I want. Well, okay, I'll just have to make a word up then. Right. Uh, and so and I I got I got pretty arty there. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but and and splain in itself is not a real word. Sure. That, that's you know that's just that's that's the Ricky Ricardo pronunciation. I was going to say explain. that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but the, the, to me the, the the twist of that song is that I, I knew that I that I was just going to you know eventually when I got around to writing the lyrics to it and I just I was writing the words that that, that just came out and and I I didn't do too much uh, editing on that one. I just I, I just like. The stuff that came out first is what I ran with, but then when I got to the chorus where it said, "I'm going to explain it all right now," but this is another thing that I do. I'm going to say I'm going to do something, and then I don't. Don't right. You know, I, 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 it's like that. I've done that several times, uh, or like the end of Potato, which is maybe my most accessible song, but it just goes, "I hope that." Yeah. It doesn't tell you what. <laughs> I hope that. You know, that's the big ending. That's it, that's my anti-entertainment thing. That's I can't seem to shake. Yeah. Is anyone I'm so popular? Exactly. Um, it, <laughs> you know, I'm 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 always you know finding trying to find interesting ways to not resolve things. Yeah. It's... Uh, so that's that's part of what Splain was about. The the kind of the the hook in that one is is just like, you know, this just this barrage of stuff that doesn't make sense, and then the chorus is like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna explain all this. Now you have so much such a diverse array of sounds, I mean, from album to album and on one album and one song. Um, how many guitars do you think you use on a typical album? I mean, I know it could vary from project to project, but, I mean, do you yeah, find, do you cart in, do you have 30 guitars in the studio uh, or do you, like, get two or three and you're more fiddling with the effects and the outboard? Usually, yeah, I'll usually come in with, like, maybe four or five at a time. Yeah. 
uh, I've, I've done some stuff recently where maybe I've, I've gone in with more. Um, sometimes it's just the, you know, because a lot of the, a lot of the time nowadays you find yourself recording in houses as opposed to studios, sure. and it's not as uh, it, it, it's not as practical to have a, a line of twelve guitars in a row. Right. Uh, so, uh, but I, you know, I'll, if I lately have done some recording in a in a recording studio, and I'll, I'll bring in maybe eight or nine guitars. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, and then, yeah, it's just uh, do what what you can with effects, uh, b- both pedals and also uh, whatever's you know rack mounted stuff or whatever's you know, in the studio, uh, and mess with it. Just mess around until you find the sounds that 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 suits the song. Yeah, that's the thing. Is I I stopped playing for several years and wasn't really up on the modeling and all that stuff. And you know. I was of course aware of it, but when I had stopped playing around, it was still something that was okay and just prohibitively expensive. So it's been such a, a treat in the last couple of years to, you know, be able to use a digital audio workstation and actually just run effects and with a couple of guitars and actually do a vast array of things sure, as opposed no to as opposed to 1998 message. with my Tascam four track. And I'm trying to lay down something with no metronome and no drummer and and damn it and re-recording it and damn it re-recording it. Yeah, and... but of course I will I will always uh, be nostalgic for those days, you know, because oh, there's course. there's something to be said for uh, the the uh, the truth of option paralysis, you know, when when you have an endless amount of stuff available to you. Right. Uh, it, there was there was something there was something really kind of crafty and cool about only having a, a certain amount of stuff to work with. And Absolutely. then you just like, you work the hell out of it. You know, you, you, you've worked it to the absolute limits of your, you know, technological limitations. Oh yeah. That's and, what makes things like the magical mystery tour so genius and things like that, because they didn't have unlimited tracks and you know, sure. Yeah. What if today would, would they still be recording Bohemian Rhapsody? Cause they could go on forever. I, I don't know. It's it, <laughs> right. Right, but uh, that's... Um, yeah. So, so I mean, I'm of that age where you know, I, I, I think, man, maybe they only had 16 tracks in the studio in 1972, but they sure got a hell of a lot done with them, you know. So. Yeah, they did. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then also, I guess it was, it was easy to leave things raw. I mean, it's, you know, talking about you know Van Halen. There's, there's something, there was something more visceral having, you know, very minimal overdubs and. And yeah, like because they were getting really good sounds at the source, you know, right. and and that should always be what record making is about is a, is a good sound at the source. You, you want to record things that sound good, right? Now nowadays you can, and and that applies to the performance as well. Yeah, I mean, you know the joke. What did the what did the Pro Tools engineer say to the band? <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> you know that's it. That was terrible. Come on in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I've heard variations of that. But yes, it, yeah, definitely. The uh, oh, talk about that. Um, I've got a. In, this may be the oldest joke in the world, but it was the first time I'd heard it a couple years ago, and and uh, it was actually Dweezil Zappa saying it was a joke that Frank, uh, not a joke, but something that Frank said. And I guess he was auditioning somebody, and uh, this this female musician was was trying out, and I don't remember what the instrument was, and tried it, and it didn't go well. And they're like, okay, thanks for coming in. Um, no, 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 let me do it again. Let me do it again. I can do better. Okay, fine. Go again. And she runs it through again. It's just not up to par. And he's like, okay, thanks for your time. She's like, no, 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 no. You got to give me another shot. I can do it better. I can do it better. And he said, um, did you ever hear the story about the carpenter? And she said, no. He said, well, there once was a carpenter and he built a door and there it is. (laughs) (laughs) That's a, that's a good story. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, uh, now, do you keep up with uh, keyboard tech as well as guitar tech? I mean, do you sort of like have what works for you, or? I, that's exactly what I do. I I, I have what works for me. I don't, it's I'm I, it's I to some degree I need to be dragged kicking and screaming and in, into new technology because if I if I have stuff that works, I have stuff that works and I'm happy. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I'm, I'm...